Hi, good day. It's Felix Manzanares from Journey Ministries. And it's our pleasure once again to share with you our message of the week. Every Tuesday, we gather for Tuesday Church at number 18 Redgate Road, Unit 2. We have a sign up and everything now, so you really can't miss it. Um, this week, uh, I encourage uh, one of our leaders, Trisha Johnson. Now, Trisha Johnson, she's the powerhouse woman. I mean, she has encouraged me over the last five or six years and in very key times in my life, even when I wasn't walking with the Lord the way I should be. And she was able to speak to me, use social media, encourage me, direct message me, say she praying for me. And when we started this ministry of over a year ago, she was at our first meeting. She was so delighted. And God has taken on a journey, you know, challenges, yes, they were there. But God has taken her on a journey, rebuilding her, rejuvenating her, renewing her calling, giving her gifts and empowerment to overcome some of her greatest challenges. And, you know, it's a delight to just hear her message this week. And the message this week is entitled, The Pit is the Process. And listen, you need breakthrough in your life if you're in a pit right now, if you're in a, a time of despair and discouragement. Listen to our testimony. Hear what God is doing in her life. And the, and the same God who took her out of the pit will do the same for you. Listen, the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. So when you hear Christ has done something in someone else's life, grab it because he can do it in yours. And he's willing to do it in yours as well. So again, this is the message of the week by one of our leaders, Trisha Johnson, entitled, The Pit is the Process. Be blessed and feel free to visit us on Tuesdays at 7.30 to 9 p.m. at Redgate Road, number 18. So God bless and enjoy the message. All right, well, I personally have been waiting for this day for a while without Trisha knowing it. I knew that something was inside of her. This is who I call a powerhouse woman. Um, if you don't know who or what that is, just spend some time with Trisha, and then you'll be like, oh, okay, that's a powerhouse woman. <laughs> um, so you'll get it. But I'm looking forward to tonight. Um, I know that just one-on-one, -on -one, Trisha encourages me, encourages me with her words, and I know that they come straight from the Holy Spirit, and that is exactly what will happen tonight. Um, so I just pray that you guys be blessed. Just stretch your hands towards Trisha, if you will. God, I just thank you so much for your servant. I thank you so much that she is available. Lord, she's not ashamed of her story. She is ready and she is willing. Her feet are firmly planted on this foundation, this rock that we just sang about. So Lord, I pray that as these words come out of her mouth, Lord, that they will sink so deep into our hearts that we will know beyond a shadow of a doubt that they are straight from your heavenly throne, that your Holy Spirit has moved through her. So Lord, we are just ready to receive. Open us up. Let our hearts become clay. In your name I pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, sir. Good night, everyone. Can you come Welcome back, Tina. Yes. <laughs> what a surprise and a treat at the same time. Um, tonight, Pastor Felix asked me to speak. I'm sorry I'm sitting because I feel more comfortable. Go ahead. But um, he asked me to speak and um, just to basically sum it up, I spoke to, you know, I was praying and I was asking God, you know, what does he want me to speak about, because obviously there's been uh, quite a few things in my life that I can say that I can bring um, some kind of message on, but um, recently I've been going through, uh, well, I've come out of it, praise Jesus, but there was uh, a lot of trial and tribulations in my life, and so tonight my title is going to be The Pit is the Process. And uh, I'm just here to share a bit about my pit that God has brought me out of. And um, if it reaches one person to me, that is all I need. Because I know that I just want you guys to know that no matter what you're going through, you're never alone. So um, I'm going to start by sharing Psalms 40, verse 1 to 5. And this was uh, a scripture that Sarah sent me a message on on Sunday. And um, I've been had a whole another title, and uh, when she sent me this um, scripture, it just completely just threw me for a loop, and I'm like, okay, this is exactly what my title is going to be, and this is exactly what God has done in my life, because there, I was in a deep pit, and he brought me out. So, I'm using the Amplified version, and it's, I waited patiently and expected for the Lord, and he inclined to me and heard my cry. He drew me out of a horrible pit, a pit of tumult and of destruction one of the miry clay froth and slime, and he set my feet upon a rock, 
setting my steps and establishing my goings, and he put a new song in my mouth and a song of praise toward God. Many shall see and fear, revere and worship, and put their trust in confident reliance in the Lord. Blessed, happy, fortunate to be envied is the man who makes the Lord his refuge and trust, and turns not to the proud or to followers of false gods. Many, O oh Lord, my God, are the wonderful works which you have done and your thoughts towards us. No one can compare with you. If I should declare and speak of them, there are too many to be numbered. Um, this relates because there's so many things that God has brought me out of. It's too many to be numbered. So I can completely relate to, um, to what he's saying in Psalms here. Um, so as I begin my message, I want to talk about recently, um, I start by giving my testimony because I can only preach and teach what I've been through and what I've been through in my life. So um, on September the 3rd, 2016, I lost my stepmother, Lori McLaughlin, to lung cancer. And she was a pivotal person in my life. She was the person I ran to for everything. She was the person I leaned on. She married my father when I was two years old. So I don't remember and recall my life without her. And that was the first of two devastating blows. I had, um, by the time this took place, exactly seven months later, I lost my father. My father to prostate cancer, and this was the second blow in six, seven months. And um, after this took place, I was just, I hit rock bottom. What I would call rock bottom, um, my father lived right down the street. So for me, just coming this direction was um, a lot of stress, a lot of strain. I didn't want to be around anyone. I had you know, a good family and journey. Everyone tried to comfort me as much as they could, but not getting over the first one and then the second blow happening, I didn't even know how to function. Um, of course, I have two kids, so Life has to go on, right? They don't stop living, they still have school, I still have a job that's relying upon me, but how do you interact? How do you grieve uh, when not even getting over the first person, but then losing the second person? Um, uh, we've been praying for their healing for a few months, and I thought for sure, I'm like, God, you can do the impossible. You know, they're gonna be healed, they're gonna be restored, they're gonna be you know, back right here with me, and then, um, when they passed away, it was, I questioned God. I didn't understand why. And um, my daughter had a, my daughter's had an amazing relationship with my stepmother. And she was their grandma. So she was everything to them, you know. And um, I didn't know what to do with myself. I didn't have the energy. I didn't have the energy to pray. I didn't have the energy to fellowship with people. I didn't want to be around my kids. I didn't want to really work. I didn't want to be around myself, which is hard, but... Um, <laughs> Um, there was a point in time where I didn't want to be around myself. Um, and I, I didn't know how I was going to get out. And there was times where I had all kinds of feelings of, of anxiety. I had feelings of loneliness, of grief, of depression. Um, and I felt like you know no one could ever understand the pain that was going on in my heart. And I was like, God, I don't see a way out. I had all these promises. you know. I felt like, um, like Joseph that had been promised so many things at a young age, and then when his brothers put him in that pit, um, I'm pretty sure that he was down there wondering, God, why did you give me these dreams? Why did you give me these promises? How am I going to get out of this hole? Um, but as we all know, God sets us up because our pit becomes the process that he transforms us through, and then when he pulls us out, it's because he has something better on the other side. And um, so after this difficult time, uh, God, started to work in my heart and started to unfold different areas of my life that he wanted me to just basically clean up. There was areas in my life that he wanted me to focus on. In the natural, he wanted me to literally start cleaning my house, you know, start um, cleaning up relationships, changing, you know, friends and people that I had been associating with that may not have been the best influence for me or even someone in my life that may have not been drawing, giving me the best kind of comfort or best guidance. So. These are areas that he started to ask, you know, tell me he needed me to clean up, and that he wanted to strengthen me. But I felt confused, and I felt 
perhaps that I couldn't see myself the way God saw me. Um, I definitely, you know, it became, it became a time where, you know, Felix and Dorothy would always message me and want to encourage me and want to spend time with me, but I was just, I had some excuse because I didn't want to see anybody. I didn't want to talk to anyone. Um, so I began to do what came natural in the flesh, which is complaining. So I complained about everything. I murmured about everything. I felt like everything was wrong and nothing would ever um, change in my life. And I was like, you know, surely God, you can't use me anymore. You know, what's the point? What's the point of, of pretending? Um, and I heard Joyce Myers say that um, to complain is to remain. So, which is very pivotal when we think about it. If we start to complain, right, what are we saying? We're remaining as we are. We're remaining in that same situation. And the dictionary explains uh, the meaning of complaint is to express dissatisfaction or annoyance about a state of affairs or an event. So, basically, it's similar to what the Israelites did, right? They remained in the wilderness um, after being freed from slavery, after God had done all these miraculous things in their life and brought them out. They remained for 40 years. Just think about that. For 40 years, they remained. They didn't lack anything. They had food, they had provision, they had housing, they had everything they needed, but they didn't reach their promise, right? So why complaining and murmuring? So as God started to unfold these different things in my life, I was like, man, I don't want to remain, but I don't know how to get out, you know? I don't know how to get out. I don't know what to do. What's the first step? Um, I mean, Sarah gave her, her testimony and her, her preaching about joy and at the same time, I understand, I could relate to certain things that she was talking about, but then I'm like, God, she has a husband. She has someone that she she has someone that can, you know, that can give her that word of encouragement when she needed it. She has someone that, you know, even when she's down, he's there to build her up. That was another thing to complain about, right? And I'm like, oh my gosh, here we go again. And I'm like, how am I gonna get out of this? Who do I have? Right? Me. I'm all alone here. Anyways, um, I just started to feel in my spirit that I just, I couldn't go on anymore. I'm like, God, I don't want to be a part of this ministry. I don't want to be a part of nothing. I just want to stay home. I said, but I need to get out of this. And then I just started to feel that I needed to worship. So at home, I started to worship. And I started to worship. And then I'm like, no, I need more than this. And so I reached out to Sarah. And I'm like, Sarah, can we do a worship night? And I'm like, I don't want to put any stress and strain on you. But can we do a worship night? I really need this. Like, I felt like... I came to the end of my rope, and there was nothing, no way to get out. There, the week before, you know, I was having even more episodes of crying and, um, and nervousness and all kinds of um, like desperate feelings because I would wake up in the morning and I'm getting ready to go to work and all of a sudden I'm just crying, brushing my teeth, I don't know why. No idea why I'm crying, can't stop, can't turn it off, but I'm just crying, brushing my teeth and I'm like, God, what is going on? Meanwhile, I have you know kids here, family, life has to go on. And there's times where we're in that um, desperate moment, and I'm like, you know, um, I need some kind of release, I need some kind of help. So I remember all this anxious feeling coming up to worship night. I'm like, you know what, God, I put such a demand on you that I know that when I get there in your presence, I know you're gonna remove whatever this junk is that is inside of me, whatever this is in my spirit that is making me feel like I can't possibly go on. So I had this desperation before God and I, and I put a demand on, on this Holy Spirit that night and I told God that I was fed up. I said, you know, I couldn't go on anymore in this condition. And after worship night, we went out to eat and we laughed and we carried on. And I was just like, man, I've never even laughed. I had even like dismissed what I had even asked God for. Until the next morning when I woke up, it was like this new strength. I had like this new um, look on life. It was like I would look at my um, thing with my father, my photos, different things, and there was no there was no grief there. There was no sorrow. There was joy. It had turned into joy, and I could actually look at him like, man, God, thank you for the time that you gave me with him. You know, I know that there's. You know, even though you he didn't heal him and he didn't, you know, um, he didn't live on this earth longer than you did, I just, I know that there's other people out there that you are going to heal, but I thank you for the time that we had with him. And like everything just started to change. I had this new joy. I no longer was crying. 
I no longer felt depressed. It had just lifted that night without me even realizing until I started to do things that I couldn't do before, right? Which was get up in the morning and not cry. Mm -hmm. Drive down the street and cut through the road where he lived and pass all his cars parked up in front there without having any issues of despair or desperation or depression or anxiety. And I'm like, God, I just thank you for removing that grief and that mourning um, from my heart. And, um, and then um, I realized that I had received a full restoration and breakthrough, not only in my heart, but also in my mind. My mind was no longer, I was no longer at work and just thinking about all that had happened to me, thinking about all my problems, all my sorrow. Um, I was able to enjoy my kids again. Even my relationship with my kids started to change. And um, when God transformed me that night, it reminds me of um, the scripture in Isaiah 61 through where it says, He will give you gladness for mourning. And that's what I felt that I had when I woke up the next morning was, was gladness and, and joy and peace, like there was such a peace in my life now that I could actually talk about him. Um, I could talk about my stepmother without having some kind of hurt in my heart. But um, basically what I want to share is whatever your pit is right now in your life, whatever it could be, um, whatever it is in your life that you don't see a solution for, that you just think, you know, this is just impossible, there's no way God could do this for me. Whatever area you've lost hope in, um, and whatever area that you can't see a way out, that's the area that Jesus is waiting to pull you out of. Mm -hmm. That's the area that he's waiting, he has his hand down, and he's like, you know what, Gina, whatever it is, you think I can't do it, but I see your cry, I see your tears, I see all your strains and your struggles, and my hand is there, and he's ready to pull you out. The pit is a trap. Just like it was for Joseph, it was a trap. His brothers set him up. Right? Because they were jealous. They were jealous of the big dreams that God had given to him. They wanted that and they were jealous because he was the favorite. And so the pit for him was meant of destruction, right? For him to not reach his calling. So whatever it is that, that pit is in our life, you just need to know and recognize that it's a trap of the enemy. But you're never supposed to remain. And it's for you to give up. The whole point of the pit is for you to give up. For you to lose hope. For you to lose sight of the promises God gave to you. And it's also can be used as a stumbling block, right? It's a situation where the enemy wants you to remain in long enough for you to believe that it's impossible for God to take you out. Um, the enemy wants you to focus on your despair. He wants your problems to be everything that you focus on. Not to focus on the solution, not to speak positive over your life, but for you to focus on everything in your life that is going wrong. Because you notice that what we focus on gets bigger and bigger and bigger. So if it's your finances, you continue to focus on that, and guess what? The bills keep coming. They keep piling up. And it seems like you'll never get out. But there's an area of your life that you're still struggling with. And that's an area you may not have surrendered yet to God. So we need to surrender our pits. Whether it's our finances, whether it's um, our family, maybe it's relationships, maybe it's our marriage our kids, our job, whatever it is, we have to surrender those areas to God so that he can pull us out. So that, Because it's it's where we get to the point where we know we can't do it on our own. Right? Where we know that we can't climb out. The pit normally is so deep we can't climb out. So that's the area that he wants to take you out of. And we have to remember that greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. And if we haven't possessed the promise yet, it's because we're not ready for it. So whatever that thing is that God has promised us, that we're still holding on to, right? It's because, think about it, you're still in that process right now. But there's things in your life that he wants to remove. He wants to take from you because it's not the best for you. It's like pruning a tree. He wants to trim the branches that aren't bearing fruit. So we can embrace this area of our life and we can say, God, I just want you to do your will. I want you to do what you, what you want to do in my life so that he can build you up. Um, and he wants to make sure that you can steward the promise before you possess it. Because if you're not at that mature level, like I said, my attitude became complaining, right? Complaining gets you nowhere, but where about the Israelites, they didn't, a lot of them didn't possess the promise. They remained. So if, we're, if we don't change our attitude and how we see things, 
then we remain in that situation as well. It hinders God from being able to pull us up and rescue us the way he wants to. So we need our attitude to fit the position in order for us to receive um, as we're going through, as we're waiting on God. Um, so let's just, um, I want us to just make up our minds to submit the process and ask God to prune us so that we're ready to receive his promise and what he's called us for. Um, Pastor Felix mentioned last week that every promise will be tested, and but we have to hold on and we have to remain steadfast as he brings it to pass. And I come to think about things in my life that God has promised me and you're right, as soon, as soon as that promise comes, you're so overjoyed and you're receiving it, you're like, oh, thank you, Jesus, oh, yes. You know, I'm going to have a new job or whatever the situation may be. I'm going to have a house. And then all of a sudden, the enemy comes right away because he wants to steal the word. He wants you to doubt what God already promised you. So when we believe the lies of the enemy um, over our lives, we remain stagnant and we delay the process of pruning. So um, I want to just say it's, we need as as a you know, child relationship with God, we need to get alone with him. You know, if you're if you have a husband or you have a wife, you need to be alone with them. You can't just have a third wheel in there all the time, right? You have to be alone with them. You have to spend quality time with them. Well, it's the same thing. That relationship with God is the same thing. You have to be alone with Him. You have to spend quality time. You have to shut off all the distractions. You have to get into His presence and you have to surrender. You can't. I can't always run to Sarah for answers. I can't always run to Gina. Gina, pray for me every minute. No, there has to be a time where I go straight to the source because Gina can't pull me out of my head. Sarah can give me encouragement, but she's, she doesn't have the strength to pull me out. So we have to learn. We have to get alone. We have to shut off all distractions and have that one-on-one -on -one relationship with him because he's waiting to wrap us up in his arms and give us the strength that we need and um, to give us the endurance that we need to, to continue. I know that um, there are many of you here tonight that have situations in your life that you've gone through. Um, whatever it is that you feel, maybe you feel like you've been a victim. Um, you feel like the same situation keeps happening to you over and over. Um, you feel like you know you can never you can never get out. You feel alone. You feel like yes, you may have um, a spouse or you may have you know family that. Christians and that support you, but at the same time, you may feel like you are alone. And that's a life from the pain of hell. And we are not alone. God is always with us. And you may feel like you're drowning. You may feel like you're under the water and you can't catch your breath because things just keep happening back to back. But I'm here to tell you that, trust me, a couple of weeks ago, I, a couple of weeks ago, that's how soon I brought, that's how quickly I got my, um, my, deliverance from all this situation. It was not a long time. It was literally a couple of weeks ago. I couldn't stand up here and I couldn't hold these things and show you, you know, what is, talk about this. I couldn't go through any of these things. But I know, you know, where, where I came from and I trust you. The joy of the Lord is my strength right now. I can sit here and I can, I can talk about it and I can drive here and I can bless everyone who came against me and I can do whatever it is that God has called me to do because I know that I no longer have that feeling anymore. And Gina can tell you she was right there with me um, through the whole thing. I no longer have those deep feelings of sorrow, depression, like I'm drowning. And then there were even times where you start to blame yourself, right? You get into situations and you're like, oh my God, it's my fault. I should never have done this. Or I shouldn't have went there. I shouldn't have, you know, made this mistake. Why do I keep doing these things? You know, but at the same time, we will continue to repeat things if we haven't surrendered it to God. Right? We're going to continue to make the same mistakes if we haven't surrendered it to God. So there has to come a point in time where you get so low and so deep that you're like, God, only you. I give up. I've tried in the flesh. I've tried in the natural, but I give it all to you. 